All right, guys. So this here is a bombshell story. It came out a couple days ago, and uh, it's being talked about a lot, but I don't think it's possible to talk about this story enough. I mean, this is really next level stuff here. So uh, Jeremy Scahill says, leaked New York Times Gaza memo tells journalists to avoid words genocide, ethnic cleansing, and occupied territory. They're telling their own journalists and reporters, you're not allowed to use these words. Okay, that's called censorship. That's also called journalistic malpractice because you're telling them you're not allowed to be honest. You're not allowed to correctly ascribe labels. That's what this is. So uh, Ryan Grimm and Jeremy Scahill did the reporting for The Intercept here. The New York Times instructed journalists covering Israel's war on the Gaza Strip to restrict the use of terms genocide and ethnic cleansing and avoid using the phrase occupied territory when describing Palestinian land, according to a copy of an internal memo obtained by The Intercept. Look, there's a problem here. This is literally, legally, the correct description. Occupied territory. It is internationally acknowledged as occupied territory. And they're blocked. They're blocked from using it. This is, this is wild. This is wild. So basically, there's a memo down from the top of the New York Times. You have to lie on behalf of Israel. The memo also instructs reporters not to use the word Palestine except in very rare cases and to steer clear of the term refugee camps to describe areas of Gaza historically settled by displaced Palestinians expelled from other parts of Palestine during previous Israeli-Arab wars. So again, yet another war on objective reality here because these are refugee camps. My guess is where this stems from is the number of times Israel bombed refugee camps. Remember when they bombed, killed over 100 people in a refugee camp? It may have even been over 200 by their own admission, to get one Hamas member. My guess is that with the backlash from that, where everybody's like, oh my god, you psychos are bombing refugee camps? That's when the New York Times kicked it into gear. Hey, but, 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 let's, let's not even use the term refugee camp. Because, you know, the problem is the description, not the actual thing that happened. This is incredible. The areas are recognized by the UN as refugee camps and house hundreds of thousands of registered refugees. The memo written by the Times Standards editor Susan Wessling, international editor Philip Pan, and their deputies, quote, offers guidance about some terms and other issues we have grappled with since the start of the conflict in October. Even that is incredibly biased. Since the start of the conflict in October. The start? Was October? Do we need to tell you about Operation Protective Edge in 2014, where Israel killed over 80% civilians? Do we need to go all the way back to 1948 and the Nakba? Do we need to discuss 1967? The start? Guys, we know the Abraham Accords and moving the embassy to Jerusalem, those things were key catalysts which led to October 7th. The whole point of U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Palestine was a middle finger to say, we're going to go around you. You don't exist. We don't care about you. We're moving the embassy to Jerusalem, Jerusalem and spitting in your eye, and we're trying to normalize relations with Israel and other Arab nations, and again, that's a way to spit in your eye and say your concerns will never be dealt with. Who cares about your rights? And that was the straw that broke the camel's back, which led to October 7th, or one of the straws that broke the camel's back. And they say, since the start of the conflict on October 7th, the start? While the document is presented as an outline for maintaining objective journalistic principles, oh my God, oh, I'm going to have an aneurysm. In reporting on the Gaza war, several time staffers told The Intercept that some of its contents show evidence of the paper's deference to Israeli narratives. You don't say, quote, I think it's the kind of thing that looks professional and logical if you have no knowledge of the historical context of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, said a Times newsroom source, who requested anonymity for fear of reprisal of the Gaza memo. Quote, but if you do know, it will be clear how apologetic it is to Israel. First distributed to Times journalists in November, the guidance which collected and expanded on past style directives about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been regularly updated over the ensuing months. It presents an internal window into the thinking of Times International editors as they have faced upheaval within the newsroom surrounding the paper's Gaza war coverage. Quote, issuing guidance like this to ensure accuracy, consistency, and nuance in how we cover the news is standard practice, said Charlie Statlander, a Time spoke spokesperson. Across all our reporting, including complex events like this, we take care to ensure our language choices are sensitive, current, and clear to our audience. 
your standards are a war on the truth. Don't nuance troll us. They have the nerve to say we're doing this for accuracy's sake. No, if you were doing this for accuracy's sake, you would say you have to use the word, the words occupied territory. You have to use the words ethnic cleansing and genocide. At this point, it is absolutely inescapable that that's what's going on. They have the nerve to spit in our eye and say, we're doing this because we're trying to be better. No, you're doing this because you're fucking biased. You're doing this because you're waging a war on the truth on behalf of the Israeli government. They continue here. Issues over style guidance have been among a bevy of internal rifts at the Times over its Gaza coverage. In other words, there's some people in the New York Times that see this for what it is. A naked attempt to lie in favor of the Israeli narrative. And there are some people there with integrity who are like, are you kidding me? In January, The Intercept reported on disputes in the Times newsroom over issues with an investigative story on systemic sexual violence on October 7th. The leak gave rise to a highly unusual internal probe. The company faced harsh criticism for allegedly targeting Times workers of Middle East and North African descent, which Times brass denied. On Monday, executive editor Joe Kahn told staff that the leak investigation has been concluded unsuccessfully. So you guys remember that. A lot of the most hyperbolic stories in the wake of October 7th totally fell apart. You, you know, 40 beheaded babies, baby in an oven, uh, systemic sexual assault by Hamas. All of these things completely and utterly fell apart. Now, by the way, that's not to say that Hamas didn't commit atrocities. Of course they did. But there were over-the-top brazen lies that the Times backed up to try to build the narrative of these are vicious monsters who are so beyond the pale and so beyond any sort of reason or logic or rationality or morality that anything that's done in response is acceptable. They helped build the narrative that led to a genocide and an ethnic cleansing. Because, oh, if you're urging restraint, oh, if you're urging more caution, well, I guess you're in favor of a baby in an oven. I guess you're in favor of uh, 40, beheaded, 40 beheaded babies. There was a big breakdown of the story on the systemic sexual assault. One of the families that was used in that piece came out and said, that's not what we told you. We didn't tell you that. You're weaving your own narrative over here. That's not true. And this goes hand in hand with, remember uh, the analysis, I think it was The Intercept that did it, that showed the type of language being used when it's uh, violence against Israelis versus violence against Palestinians. When it's violence against Israelis, it's terrorism massacre, slaughter, they use words like horrific, when it's violence against Palestinians, it's passive language. There was a blast. A blast occurred. Well, blast? Who did the blast? I guess the blast better stop that. They don't say, they don't, they don't assign agency and intent when it's Palestinian civilians being killed. It's passive language, it's neutral language, all the emotive language is used uh, for Israelis. And now we know. Guys, this is how comical it's gotten. This is how comical it's gotten. Avoid words like genocide, ethnic cleansing, and occupied territory. Well, let me ask you a question. If we got to 200,000 Palestinians dead, 170,000 of them civilians, then would you be okay with calling it genocide? I mean... Israel announced, we want to take the people of Gaza and push them through the Rafah border to set up a tent city in the Sinai Desert. That's what we want to do. That is textbook ethnic cleansing. They announced it, and you're not allowed to call a spade a spade? So would you ever, under any circumstance, be able to use that word? We all know the answer. The answer is no. The answer is no. If you can't say occupied territory when it is very clearly occupied territory in the West Bank, if you can't do that, what are we doing here? I want to reiterate, it's a war on the truth. It's a war on the truth in favor of the Israeli narrative. They said you're not allowed to use the word Palestine. Again, tell me how that's not biased. I'd love to know what were the very rare instances they could use it. Here's the main takeaway. Paper of record, my ass cheeks. There's this myth that goes around. This idea that the establishment legacy traditional, institutional media outlets. Like, they are, they're just more serious. They're more serious. They're more objective. They care more about the truth. It's just not true. The establishment and the legacy media, they have their own uh, sacred cows and pieties 
and their own narrative that they try to adhere to come hell or high water. And you've never seen a more clear example than what you're seeing here. If you say you can't use terms that very obviously and clearly apply, there's no other thing to call that, but you have a policy of lying. Your policy is to lie. Your policy is to gaslight. How pathetic is it when, like, a YouTube show like mine <laughs> is more truthful than the fucking New York Times? And by the way, they're doing it to themselves, right? They're destroying their own credibility. That's what this is. Because here's the thing. There is, like, there's a right-wing version of skepticism of mainstream media that functionally is just wrong. Why? Because their take is, we don't like mainstream media, but we believe every single thing Donald Trump says. It's like, well, no, he's fucking lying to you too. And honestly, probably lying to you even more, right? But like, they made their bed and they're now going to sleep in it. These are self-inflicted wounds. There's a reason why. You look at the polls and trust in media is always at a historic low the more time goes by. People see through your bullshit. And by the way, final point. This all links in, doesn't it, to remember that war on TikTok that they're doing where they're trying to ban TikTok? Now, by the way, they're trying to slip that provision into a bill on foreign aid to Ukraine and Israel. They're trying to slip the TikTok ban in there. So they're trying to ban TikTok because there's a lot of pro-Palestine stuff on TikTok. You have threads and Instagram and Facebook try, are now burying all political content. And so... They're trying to steer you in the direction of only uh, go to the traditional media outlets, the legacy media outlets, whether it's in print or on TV, and um, take their word for it. And all the other alternate sources, it's like they try to clamp down on it a little, right? And here we are. I don't know why anybody should trust you about anything after this memo comes out. They shouldn't trust you about anything. You are gagging your journalists. You are censoring your own journalists. You are waging a war on the truth to soften the image of what's happening in Gaza to be more favorable to the Israeli government. It's beyond pathetic. Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop and watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.